Welcome to the Beyond Fashion Business Podcast. In this week's episode, we sat down with Kate Spade co-founder and Francis Valentine founder, Elise Ahrens. Kate Spade is a multi-billion dollar fashion brand that revolutionized the affordable luxury market in the early 2000s. After selling Kate Spade, Elise started yet another highly successful fashion brand called Francis Valentine. In this episode, Elise shared the key principles and secrets behind her success in building incredible fashion brands. I hope that these insights are invaluable in your understanding and approach to starting and growing fashion brands. If you're interested in joining our free fashion business course or our private community of fashion entrepreneurs, make sure you click on the link in the description of this episode. Hope they are valuable in your fashion journey. Without further ado, let's get into this week's episode. Amazing, Elise. Thank you for the time once again. I'm really excited for the conversation. Happy to be here today. Thanks for having me. All right. Let's um, get everything started, shall we? Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, you've done a couple of interviews in the past, but just for the sake of the people that don't know anything about you, uh, the brand, mm-hmm. kind of like, can you give us a very brief bio on exactly that, who you are, the brand, kind of like an overview of the story? And you'd be you have you can be brief right you can just be 30 okay. 60 seconds no need of okay i'll try and make a long story short um, of course of course i know it's difficult <laughs> well i i grew up on a farm in kansas so being in the fashion business is sort of the opposite of where i came from but um, i always loved fashion and knew i wanted to move to new york someday so after college i moved to new york and uh, really had my uh idea set on working in a fashion magazine. And I ended up working in the fashion business for a lot of different companies. Um, One, which your listeners probably will never have heard of, but it was called JG Hook. Um, And it was uh, kind of a preppy uh, East Coast company. And so worked there. I went on to work at Gerbeau Jeans, which was a French jean company, is a French jean company, the hottest jeans at the time in the late 80s and early 90s. And then I met my, or I, I started... Um, a handbag company with my best friend from college. It was Kate Spade. And we started that business with handbags, added shoes, added, oh my gosh, we added every product category imaginable over time. And it was just, we were working 24 seven for many years and owned that business for about 13 years um, from 1993 and sold that company in 2006. And at that point, we were like, yay, we never have to work again. And we thought it'd be so much fun. But you don't realize how much you miss work when it's not there anymore. And I had never not had a job in my life. So all of a sudden, not having somewhere to go, even though I had just had my third child, um, was really strange for me. So I got really involved with my kid's school, did that for 10 years, um, a myriad of different volunteer um, jobs, and Katie and I started talking about starting a business again, and I guess about 2014, and we started Francis Valentine in 2016. We launched it to the public, and we started with handbags and shoes, and uh, in 2018, uh, we lost Katie. And we created two pieces uh, sort of as a tribute to her. One was a caftan that she wore on every vacation. And one was a vintage sweater that we had purchased years before. And um, so we created those two pieces sort of as as, uh, an homage to her. And they sold out immediately. And all of a sudden, all of our customers started asking us for all the vintage pieces we were using to style our ad campaigns. Cut to... We started making sweaters and caftans and pants and jackets. And now we have a full apparel collection as well as our handbags and our footwear. So it's grown really steadily over time since 2016. And um, it's it's been um, a very busy ride and a lot of fun. Mm, Great. Great bio. (laughs) No, and that was that was perfect length, by the way. So you see, you've had, you've had some practice before. (laughs) Um, Wow. Okay. Where do, where do I want to officially begin? I mean, from farmhouse to New York, to partnering up with Kate Spade, to starting two successful fashion brands. Again, sounds very simple, but a lot of things probably happened in between all of those things. So 
Looking back into your career so far, what do you think was the biggest, the first biggest major setback or challenge? Was it more personal? Was it more emotional? Was it logistically like you had to get out of the farm, right? What, what, do, you, what do you remember was the, the, the first challenge to get you where you, when you were, you know, at least in the farm to at least to then? Yeah. So I think probably it's been a consistent challenge throughout my career career and starting up two businesses is cash flow. It's always an issue. And I think for most entrepreneurs, it's an issue. And um, even when we were starting Francis Valentine with Kate Spade, we had to be really scrappy. We didn't spend money on anything. We found furniture or bought furniture at flea markets for our offices. And um, we, you know, we, we all had to put in personal money when we could and, you know, fund the business for a while. We never took outside money until several years into the business when we got a credit line at the bank. Um, for Francis Valentine, we, we, you know, actually had money to start this business. But as you grow, you constantly need capital. And every entrepreneur knows this. If you're successful, you need more capital to grow the business because you're getting larger orders for the following seasons and you have to produce all those things. So I think the constant theme throughout um, is just raising capital on a consistent basis as you grow. Right. And what are your thoughts on going through the process of, you know, having limited cash flow, which is, as you said, it's, it's, it never stops. It's the, it's the problem in this industry. Right. But when you're early on, you have very little experience and having very little experience results in even less cash flow because mm -hmm. of, you know, bigger and more mistakes. So right. how do you balance that equation? Right. So how do you balance? the lack of cash flow with the lack of experience? Well, you know, I think part of that is, and and we didn't really have to experience this when we were younger at Kate Spade, just because we were determined not to take anybody's money. And, you know, I hate to say it, but times were different then. We were very different in the marketplace and we were kind of new kids on the block and people weren't really doing what we were doing. Um, so I think it was a little different then. And the economy was different. Today, it's, I think, tougher to get capital. And I think one of the things that is helpful always is to go to as many events, as many networking opportunities as you can and meet as many people as possible because you never know when you might meet the ne next investor or someone who's interested and loves your idea and buys your product already. And they may become a friends and family investor because I think friends and family investors are really, they're always generally always the seed money for beginning entrepreneurs. And it's how we started when, um, you know, we went out to raise capital in 2018. Um, we went to friends and family who had known that we started a successful business and sold it before and believed in this brand. And so, you know, I think that is a good way if you, if you, are young and you don't have any money and you feel like you don't have any contacts, make them because it's, it is really the best way, whether you're, you know, at, um, if you went to university and you, there are alumni reunions or sorority or fraternity reunions, anything like that, um, any place you can meet a new group of people, I would encourage people to go to. Interesting. So, <clears throat> Cash flow is always the problem. The only difference 20 years ago versus today is that, no, well, I mean, maybe cash was less available back then, but there was also less competition and therefore less dilution of profit margins. And also, I think a big problem today is that the mindset, the mindset, the or the, the nature of capital has changed. Uh, capital today is very, very transactional uh, and it pushes low, low valuations which obviously puts brand owners in very difficult situations. And I think that just like you said, attracting angel investors or people that are putting their own money in the business is just the right type of, right to, the right type of capital that you want to look for. Because fashion is a diff very difficult industry to raise money in. Uh, you need investors that number one, understand the nature of the industry and just believe in you as an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. more than it's like on the business plan and on the financial figures and the financial projections and the nature of the economy and the market and all these different val uh, variables that you know established investors or accredited investors usually look look at exactly interesting and 
when you because i really want to i don't know i don't know if i should really go into and i let's let's stay in the, in the capital conversation a little bit longer because i think it's just such an important problem for for startup brand founders especially today yeah yeah a hundred percent so let's put a hypothetical scenario if you have to start from scratch today with the current challenges uh without the connections that you probably have now what would be the approach? Would it be let's let me figure out who, who who where I can raise money from? Would I start an e-commerce brand and try to get one product right? Like, what would be your strategy? Oh, that's tough because there you know there are a lot of avenues you can look at to to go to for for fashion. It's you know obviously you can use factors, and I think if you don't have any other means to find capital and you have no contacts, factors may be a good way to go if you have a healthy wholesale business. Um credit lines if you have you know a good uh credit history banks are pretty and if you're willing to you know sign a personal guarantee um that's always a good way to go but that you know I, I think it's tough everywhere right now and I wouldn't have said this two years ago when valuations were much higher and uh interest rates were much lower um, but I think today is a particularly difficult time right and are but do you agree that you disregarding of the type of environment that we're going through whether it's good or bad of course right now it's bad a couple of years it was good but that's always repeating itself in cycles so right would you agree that at least that having the mindset that you should adapt in today's environment so in the worst type of environment is the most productive mindset to have long term disregarding of the environment is good I do. I mean, I would still do it the same way. I would go out to friends and family. I would use factors if I had to and get a credit line at the bank. I'd right. still in do fact, it. Right, right. In fact, there's just so people that don't know are kind of like financial intermed intermed intermediary. How do you say that? Intermediary. God damn. How do you intermediaries? <laughs> Is that how you should pronounce it? Yeah. I don't know, God, that's a I don't know which word you're trying for. <laughs> Inter like um intermediary? Wow intermediary that's the one intermediary yes. it's yes. like a financial okay. intermediary like an agent that provides cash mm -hmm. right so for people for people that don't know wow that's a very i'll practice that word afterwards um <laughs> okay and what about from a from a would you say that would easier easier way to put this question would be when you analyze the success of kate spade which obviously it's been i mean it's a historical success um mm -hmm. And the success that you've had now, obviously the scale of success is differed. What are the variables that are consistent in both success stories? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, you know, I think it's great product, really well designed, well crafted, but at an accessible luxury price point. And um, you know, it was something for both companies when we've launched both of them that those things were very important, that they had a distinct point of view and they were different from anything else on the market, that they were made of the best quality items, but that they were affordable for people who aspired to have luxury pieces and wanted to pay less. So th there was, you know, um, Katie and I were out shopping after we sold the first business and um, we went to Bergdorf Goodman and I was ready to, you know, spend some money and buy a new pair of shoes. And and um, so I found the most adorable pair of orange patent loafer or patent leather shoes. And I was like, oh, I'm getting these. They're I'm for sure I'm getting these, but they were $1,200 and I could afford to buy the $1,200 shoes, but I didn't want to spend $1,200 on this pair of shoes. I, I, and we knew at that point how to design and, and have those type of shoes made. And they could be $500. They don't need to cost that much. And so, you know, I think um, that is a common thread through both businesses that we started. And um, it's the thing that keeps our customers coming back to us over and over again. Um, there's a real differentiation in our product that's, that's very different from anything else out there. And it's what we hear from our customers over and over again. I also think that having a team that is gracious and of course, they have to be good at their jobs, but a team who's polite and nice and friendly to everyone with whom you do business is really important because you want not only your customers to be happy with 
dealing with you, but also all the people who you're, all your vendors, the people who you're buying materials from and your factories and um, the wholesale people. And, you know, I think all of those things really matter because we spend so much time at work and it's our life. And it's, to me, one of the most important things about um, the business is the culture of the business. Interesting. So value proposition and team slash culture. Yes. Okay. And I mean, I'll, I'll focus a little bit more on the, on the value proposition kind of like conversation, because I think that comes even before the financial question, you need to get the value proposition, right? Because before you even worry about finances, because finances, if you don't get that right, are non-existent, right? Unless you're just burning money and capital. Uh, but that said, what do you think is the, do you think that the nature of value propositions, is it consistent? So do you think that, you know, in your case, affordable luxury, do you think that is all, there's always a window of opportunity for the same value propositions in different specific niches and customer segments? Or do you think value proposition is just very relative to the timing? What have you learned about the nature of value prop of successful value propositions in fashion? Um, you know, I think there are people who really care about it. And I think once they find a brand that they really like, in particular, um, you know, women over the age of 40 are very loyal customers because they've shopped their whole lives. They know what they like. And a lot of them just don't have time to go out and find new brands that they, you know, to try new things. And they're extremely loyal because if, if, for instance, if I go out and find a great pair of pants, I'm going to go back to that brand over and over again, because the design's right, the quality's great, and the price point's right for me. So I think there is, um, you know, a segment of customers who are really become loyal, as long as your product remains consistent in all those areas. Mm. And when you analyze consistency in product, especially nowadays, what do you think is more i mean they're all important right quality design price but obviously the importance probably fluctuates a little bit over time so how would you how would you prioritize it because when you're when you're early on right you have very limited resources you don't know what to prioritize on and developing good product is incredibly difficult so where do you think the market's at do you think focusing on okay how do i how do i get a good enough product but with incredible profit margins relative to quality uh what what's your what's your can you take us through just your overall mindset on, on good product development? Yeah, well, they're all important. So we have to check every box because if, for instance, you know, we have this beautiful cashmere sweater that's recycled cashmere. It's gorgeous. I love it. It's so pretty. But the sweater is going to end up to be $1,200 and it's not really within our price matrix. So we didn't end up making it. I'd love to because it's, you know, it's recycled, which is really important to a lot of people. Um, but it doesn't really fit in our price matrix. So, you know, we obviously can't do that. But as far as quality goes, things have to have quality and they have to have a point of view. And the the product itself has to be be differentiated. And if they don't check all three of those boxes, they don't go in the collection in the end. I mean, we sample a lot of different things. Um, and I would say probably 40% of what we sample actually makes it into the collection because of one reason or another. Um, we probably oversample a lot, um, but for us, there's not one that's more important than the other. They all three are really important to our brand and our mm. products. Okay. And what's your overall thought on developing collections versus developing really, really strong individual products first? Uh, especially early on, you know, the should people be mm. focusing on building good collections or should people just try to focus on getting one product right and doing that very well? I think it depends on the channel you're selling to. Um, because for instance, if you're just doing e-commerce and, you know, making things for your own retail stores, you can do anything you want. I mean, you can do a singular product in five colors and just make that a giftable item that you sell or, you know, whatever that product is. But I think for if you're selling wholesale, they need to be told a story. They need a collection. They need a reason to buy all 10 things in that group, or at least pick seven of them because of a, you know, what tells a story. So we'll generally, you know, in our handbag collections, we'll have at least three styles, sometimes four, sometimes five. 
Um, we don't generally do just one bag because it needs to sit and be merchandised and look beautiful. And, um, you know, you need to have options. Yeah, communicate the entire brand instead of, of course. Right. Okay, understood. Right. Tells a story. Right, of course. So if you're going to have a more focused, uh, wholesale focused approach, collections are probably a more important factor. If you're going to sell directly to a consumer through an e-commerce channel or something similar, uh, maybe starting out with one really good product might be the way. It could be. It, it really depends on the product. For us, um, we like to tell a story even on e-commerce and in our catalogs that we do. So so that every page you turn isn't something completely different than the page before. There's a, there's a theme and a mood to all of it. And um, we like it to flow really nicely. Okay. And when it comes to making those decisions on the long term and also the day-to-day -day decisions, uh, where, where is your head at? Like, would... What, what kind of things, what kind of skill sets, what kind of specific aspects of the industry are you looking at? What's your personal decision-making style? Because the the fashion industry involves so many different things, so many different skill sets, mindsets, character traits, and so many different things that are so relative to so many other different things that you have zero control over. So what yeah. what is truly important for you? Like if you have to dilute the entire fashion business part of this industry or the entire fashion brand building process, how would you describe your role in it? What are you truly looking at? And what would you truly, what would you look at if you had to do it all over again? If I have to dilute it. So if you have to, if you took the entire complexity of the industry and you said, okay, this is the role that I play. This mm -hmm. is my specific skill set. This mm -hmm. is what I'm really good at. This is how I make decisions. And these are my values and priorities when it comes to building brands, mm -hmm. how would that look like? I think it's everything I've just told you before, which are is about the product and how important that is and the people who are involved in making and producing and selling the product. Cause it, and the it's financing. All, it's all, well, yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> if, I could, if I could get rid of one thing on my list of things I always have to do, it'd be fundraising. Um, yeah. And, you know, you, as an entrepreneur, you have to be good at it. You have to get good at it because it's, uh, it's always, it's critical and you have to do it all the time. Um, that would be the thing. Bye. That would be the thing. Um, I would probably like to take off my job description list, but, you know, aside from that, um, design is my favorite part of it. And it's, uh, the most fun because it feels like, we're opening Christmas a Christmas box when we get new samples in. It's just the most thrilling time because we start to see the whole season take shape in front of us. Um, I actually love being in wholesale appointments because I love talking to our customers all the time and understanding what their customers looking for and what they liked about our past collection. Um, and most of all, I think I love working with our team here because we have a fantastic group of people. Hmm. And when it comes to again, developing good products since it is such an important part of the process. Is it all mostly entire, entirely customer-based? So understanding what the customer wants and kind of delivering something in the unique uh, value proposition of the brand or how, 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 like if you have to put a ratio of this is how much we pay attention to the customers versus this is how much intuitively we know what the customers want, what would you put your decision-making on or at least the mm -hmm. brand's philosophy at? That's a good question. You know, so much of it is what I personally want as a customer and what um, all the different pieces I need for per season. And we want to make sure that we have every piece of those. So, uh, you know, a great pair of pants, a great jean, um, a jacket for the season, um, T-shirts and colors and, and things that really coordinate back to each other. So we make it easy, not only for our wholesale partners, but when we're merchandising our store so that it really looks cohesive when you walk in, you're like, oh my God, I love everything in this collection. Because, and, it, and it just looks like walking into a candy store and you just want everything. Um, I don't even remember your question. I can just keep talking about our, our product. No, no. So so when, when it comes to the, your product development approach, how much is it focused oh, okay. on the yeah your personal yeah. intuition versus customer feedback. Yeah, so you know, we have a whole section that we call essentials and those are sort of 
all the things you really need to have in your closet all the time, um, which are the building blocks to me of, you know, any, any closet or wardrobe. And then all of the other pieces that, um, and they're all seasonal. It's, it's what makes it fun. So really great spring dresses and caftans and fun summer tops. And, um, you know, we are very print heavy, um, with everything that we do. And, and we use a lot of bold colors. Um, a lot of them are vintage prints that we've purchased. They might be from the 1930s or 40s or 50s. So there's a story behind all of them, but we'll coordinate a lot of those with um, solids and textured fabrics. So every group kind of tells its own story. And we have you know several print groups in each season that we do or every month. Um, and it's really, you know, a lot of it is what we want to make because we might have found this really cool vintage piece that you know I've never seen before in my life and so we'll make that and put it in a really cool print that will be a whole new skew for us and then we know what our customers do like so what we sold um you know last season in spring if we're designing spring again we'll be like okay that dress sold 10 to 1 over the other one and so we'll recolor that dress. We'll, we might make some changes to it and look at all of our customer comments and what customer service had to say. And we listen to all of our retail stores. We've got nine retail stores. So we get to hear from that them on a regular basis. So Interesting. It's, it's a combination. And I can't give you an exact percentage of what it is, um, but I would say probably 60% of the collection are things that are repeated um, because our customers like them so much and we'll recolor them um, or use a different fabrication. And then 40% of it are brand new silhouettes. Right. Interesting. Wow. That's perfect. And the, the only reason why I asked the question in percentages is because it's one of these abstract questions that most entrepreneurs will kind of like figure out intuitively as they understand their brands. But for people that are not going through the process, at least they can kind of understand, right? Like the amount of energy and right. The, the right approach towards developing these products because people have no idea, right? And into how developing. Right. right. And when they're, when they're not experienced, they don't really know what their brand is truly about. They're still trying to figure things out. But at the same time, they're still trying to develop products so that people buy them and they can get lost in the process, right? Uh, and if they get lost in the process, the brand gets lost in the process. And, you know, it's difficult to get back from that. Okay. And... And, I, you know, just further on that point, I think it's different for every single brand. Some some might do 20% new, new silhouettes because that might be right for what they're making and selling. So, it, you know, that's just that just happens to be ours. Um, but I think every company is different. Perfect. So the answer is not this is the right percentage or this is the right percentage right. amount is you have to develop your own. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. And you find you find what works for you through your value proposition and through your value proposition through the way that you develop products. Interesting. Okay. And going back to my original questions, because this was all kind of like a result of the question of what made what were the similar similarities between the Kate Space success story and your success today? But what about the differences? What has been different? that you think had played a major role in success or enjoyment of the process? Mm. Well, I'll tell you the, the, with the last business, I had three partners. There were, there were four of us who started and ran the business and we divide sort of everyone divided up what we were really good at and had to take over because the, we were really growing so quickly. Um, and here, um, you know, although I started it with Katie and Andy, you know, I, I find myself running this business alone. We have, we have a great team, but it's different in that I don't have partners to, you know, talk to on a regular basis, which right or delegate yeah. productively with, you know, who's better at this thing, who likes doing this. Right, right. Yeah. exactly. Exactly. And and out of all the roles, can you could you give us a very brief overview of what the roles and, and, and founder structure looked like back in Cade versus what it looks like today in terms of uh, things that people were responsible for? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, back then, I mean, at the beginning, we all did everything at, at, at Kate Spade. And um, 
we ended up, you know, a, a lot of times duplicating efforts and having different ways of doing the same thing. But so we decided that we should probably just, you know, like figure out who was best at doing what. So um, Katie and Andy obviously did design and um, Andy did, you know, all the branding for the brand and marketing. Um, Pamela did all of the product development and production and I did sales and international sales. And then, you know, a lot of the, um, we had to development. Hire, yeah. we had to hire a lot of people really fast too. Mm-hmm. So I did a lot of the um, hiring back then. Um, and then now, um, you know, when we started, I was really doing a lot of the business stuff, but Katie and I worked on a lot of things together. And because it was, you know, we, had done this before we've been down this road before so it was we had all these ideas of the products we wanted to make when you know when we got started um and then you know everything changed and the world turned upside down in 2018 and we added a few new product categories and that's really um i have loved working on apparel um it's been one of those things that we did when we had a license in japan for kate spade and i got to work with them very closely on apparel back then um so it's this is one of the the things that i've really enjoyed taking on here that we didn't really do in at at the old business um we we were always focused on accessories there and um home products and a lot of lifestyle categories but we never did an apparel line uh, when we owned the company. So doing it here is kind of like a fresh start and something new and a new product category that has just catapulted the business um, kind of into a new phase, which is really nice. Um, but we pretty much have the same team we started with at Francis Valentine. We've added a lot more people over the last few years, but um, there are a few who uh, worked with me at Kate Spade years ago. Um, our head of product is one of them. Um, our head of retail is another. And it's wonderful because it feels like family, which is really nice. Interesting. Okay. Wow. So foundationally, design, communications, production, sales, or business development. Mm-hmm. And the only difference to that to today is that, of course, less founders. Therefore, each founder needs more responsibilities. But you understand that your expertise and your experience was more in business development, but additionally, because of your passion for developing categories and design, you are much more involved in that part of the process now as well. Right. Right. Mm. Okay. And what other big difference in terms of the success? What What were some of the variables that, you know, you look back and you know what? This was something very important that we had back then that it's difficult to replicate right now, or we're doing our best to replicate, right? The right product, the right time um the right channel right what because you probably think about these things so what have you what have you thought about those major differences so i think the the big difference is back then we were 29 30 years old and we were making products that we wanted at the time and they were you know a runaway success they were great it was sort of a generation of women who it was their first big purchase um, that made them feel like, you know, they finally entered, you know, the professional world. And I think people saved up to buy those bags and it was really important and special for them. And I love hearing stories about that. It's really fantastic. Um, the difference with Francis Valentine is we started this when we were in our fifties. And once again, we made products that we wanted at, at the time. So the things that we're making today are different than the things that we wanted to make when we were 29 years old. So there's, you know, there's just a, there's, I think, a difference in what people want at different ages of their lives. Of course, you always want great design. You always want great quality, but there are just certain differences in, you know, for instance, I always like things with sleeves now. Because after you reach a certain age or after I have reached a certain age, I always want to wear sleeves. <laughs> um, and, you know, it's just one of those differences that I didn't have to think about when I was 29, but I'm thinking about in my 50s. So um, that's probably the largest difference is who we were when we started those, when we started each of these companies and our right. perspective. Right. So the difference was in just identity. And the biggest result in success relative to identity is that the identity that you had back then happened to be kind of like a catalyst in an almost cultural movement. 
because it, it was kind of like a cultural movement like this 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 accessible luxury kind of like era where exactly that like younger people were started for the first time ever to have access to like really really strong products the tory birches the kate spades uh mm -hmm. so i think um and there's some there's a lot of a lot of things to learn from that right because it's it's people i think people consistently try to chase for those catalyst moments when in reality it's more about finding your identity and staying consistent for as long as you can so that you can take it eventually take advantage of those opportunities because they happen right they just happen at different points in time and the likelihood of it happening early on in your career it could happen but it's not very likely so that's why mm -hmm. confidence and consistency in your identity over long periods of time would be more important than just trying to understand the overall market and trying to create something to adapt to that instead of to adapt to yourself right. and what you want to create because i think you'll always be behind if you do that I agree. Okay. Wow. Interesting. And okay. Now we have the kind of like foundations established that only took us 50 minutes. Um, but it's, it's the way it's the way it goes, right? Foundations are important, but now that you have the foundations, right? You have the good product development, right? You have the team in place. You're starting, you have a validated value proposition. People are buying stuff. You have mm -hmm. decent margins, I guess. What would be the next thing is then financing comes into place or financing at the very beginning to sort of like for you to figure out this equation first? Or do you think people should be more focused on figuring out the equation by themselves as a high side hobby, get something working? And then mm -hmm. when it comes to growth, then was when the, the financing conversation starts. Well, I think I think it can be done either way. I like to get a groundswell before taking anyone's money. So I think if if you can show some success before it, it helps you, you know, sell people on the idea that this is really great. People want this. We've had some success. We're selling, you know, here, here, here. Um, so I think it's better to get it started and then go after money. Um, you know, it would have been easy for us right at the beginning had we, be because of our history, and saying, oh, the partners of Kate Spade are getting back together, we could have raised a lot of money to do that, but we didn't. We we funded it ourselves and um are raising money on the on you know on the later end. Um and it's just been the way we've done. It. I don't know if it's the right way or wrong way. I think you could do it either way. Um but I do think having some success with your product really helps before going out to to raise funds. Interesting. Was that, would you say that's one of the things that you did wrong at Kate Spade that you learned about and improved this time around? Or what would you, what would you say are in hindsight, the biggest mistakes you made with Kate Spade that you learned from and you applied correctly this time with uh, Francis Valentine? I can't think of any really big mistakes we made, but we made a ton of little mistakes every day. And it's just, you know, right. Shipping is late. The quality is bad. <laughs> Why is it? Right. Uh, yeah. We, that we were always very particular about that. Um, but I think probably saying yes to projects that other people wanted us to do that we weren't re weren't really in our um, in our plans and we weren't weren't really in our within our aesthetic. Um, I remember, brand, as they say. Yeah, exactly. Bendels wanted us to do uh, neon bags for them, and I remember Katie was like, "I really don't want to do those," and and you know they threatened to pull their other business if we didn't do it for them. So we made them. And, uh, but of course, you know, a lot of them got returned to us because people didn't really like them and we ended up selling them a sample sale. So it was, those were the kind of lessons that we learned, you know, as young entrepreneurs. And it's sort of like, listen to your own gut and don't let someone talk you into something that's not on brand, not part of your aesthetic and not something you want to do. Right. Which is one of the things that comes with maturity and experience. You now, I think when you're young, you know, there's a lack of confidence in your identity as a brand. It happens because you're young, you have insecurities or you've never done it before. Uh, and as you come older, you understand not only who you are, but what you're trying to create stands for. And you have the confidence and experience to stay very disciplined in terms of the direction that needs to go to disregarding right. how urgent a project might be or how much money you're getting for a specific collaboration. It's just that that's that discipline through consistency and identity and experience. Yeah. I think you learn how to say no. Too. Which is sometimes, which is the real challenge, right? Is understanding what things to say no and what few things to say yes to. Because right. for every a hundred things you say no, you say yes to maybe one of them. 
Right, exactly. Okay. And how do you, when it comes to financing, because it mm-hmm. is, is kind of like the question, what's your approach in to, what's your general approach to financial allocation? Is it, how can we make the product better? How can we make the profits? And, and it's, I know you're going to say everything, right? But mm-hmm. just so that people can have a good idea of where, where to start mm-hmm. looking yeah. for signs on what to invest in if they, and they, if they find themselves in that position. Is mm-hmm. it, okay, what's our weakness? And how can we use capital to turn that weakness into maybe not a strength, but at least not a weakness anymore? Or is it, how do we double down on our strengths? Like, what do you use capital for, essentially? You know, m- so much of it goes towards marketing, um, both on social and in catalogs. Um, We spend some on marketing for our wholesale partners and some on our stores as well, but the majority of it really is for direct consumer business. Um, You know, I think, and, and unfortunately that's where if you find you've had a short month and you didn't make your budget, marketing has to be cut for the next month. And that's always what's tough because, you know, there's a direct correlation between what your marketing spend is and, you know, what, how many customers you actually bring to your site or into your stores. So that I think that's always tough and it's a balancing act all the time uh, of what you're doing. Um, you know, we do always look at every factor we can when we're developing product. We really work with the factories on the best price. Um, and we look at materials, you know, that are not only sustainable materials when we can, but the best price sustainable materials. Um because all of those things within the product matter to your margin. Um, where it's getting made, you know, now with tariffs in Asia being so high and they might even go higher, um, you know, looking to other countries to get things manufactured uh, has been really important to us. Um, I'm trying to think where else we are constantly, you know, saving. It's it's just, it's kind of across the board in, um, all the way through from where we start on the product um, to the end, which is the marketing part of it. Right. So the only thing that you can expect with some type of predicting with predictability is that you need to invest or use your finances to invest in marketing because marketing will fuel growth and you need to feel growth in order for you to be able to be responsive to the challenges that change week to week, month to month, year to year in this industry. Yeah. And it's nice, you know, being a small company, and I think for most entrepreneurs, it allows you to be nimble. So if you decide, oh, you know what, the best thing for me to do with, you know, the few thousand dollars I have to spend this month is go do the show at the Coterie at the Javits Center, because that's that's where I need to get more customers, more wholesale customers. And, uh, you know, one of the things we didn't talk about is... We are omni-channel, meaning we have wholesale business, we have nine of our own retail stores, and we have e-commerce. And e-commerce was sort of the backbone of the business. It's where we started. Uh, And having those three channels is really difficult because each one of them has its own needs and they're complicated and how you- It's like three different businesses. Like three different businesses. However, I personally think it's really worth it for several reasons. One is our customer can find us wherever she shops. So she can find us online. She can find us in our own retail stores that are branded with all of our own things and get a full sense of the brand. Or she can go to her favorite retailer and find us there. Um, Secondly, we learn so much from our wholesale partners at market when we're meeting with them. And they help us inform our own buys for our own retail stores and and our e-commerce business. So you know, we might think that this one jumpsuit's like the best thing since sliced bread and, oh, we should order hundreds of those. But in reality, when the retailers come in and talk to us, nobody bought it. And we want to know why they didn't buy it. So there, there could be something that we're not thinking about that they know so that we're not going to buy, you know, thousands of those units. We're just going to buy a handful of them instead because we still like it, but you know, it, it it informs so much of what we do in meeting with them. So it really does help. It's um, omni-channel is really difficult, but I think it's worthwhile. Hmm. Back to the financial equation, right? Can you raise mm-hmm. money to actually develop all of them at the, th- uh, at the same time? At it's the same just, time? 
That's what I think that that's why fashion is just so difficult because if you analyze fashion overall, there's definitely there's definitely the same path, right? That repeats itself. It's categories, channels, uh, good product, categories, channels. I mean, categories, the solid distribution, solid margins, good brand. Mm -hmm. That is repeatable 10 years, 15 years from now, 20 years from now. But everything that you need to make those things happen on a day-to-day -day basis changes so quickly and so fast based on so many different things that you have zero control over. So it's what brings you consistency, right? Because you need some type of consistency. You can't just be responsive to, yeah, it's important to be responsive, right? But it's not all you can be on a day-to-day -day basis. So mm -hmm. for you, what brings that consistency? Is it what is the brand and what are our customers value and the rest we're willing to be flexible and responsive around? Um, that's a tough question to answer. You know, I think what helps us is having our really good manufacturing partners because I feel like they are really consistent. They don't, they don't really make big mistakes, which is, you know, like I'm knocking on wood. Um, it, it's, it matters because if you have to let down some of your wholesale partners, you've got, you know, a hundred calls to make because something didn't make it in time or, you know, a die lot got messed up. Um, but luckily we have excellent partners and, um, you know, they, they always ship us on time in full, which is great. Um, I think that helps having a calendar to stick to that you really stick to keeps things in check and on time. Um, we do everything here ourselves. I mean, we don't outsource anything. All of our creative is in-house, our photography is in-house, our e-commerce is in-house. Like everything we do, we do ourselves. Um, and with a small team, everybody knows what everybody else is working on. So there's not a lot of miscommunication. Um, it helps run smoothly. Our senior team is you know, a group of six people and might be seven now. Um, but we all discuss everything once a week, everything everyone's working on so that we all know what's happening in the business. If, if something's going on in one of our retail stores, our production people know about it. Like just so that one hand knows what the other's doing and everybody's on the same page. Um, we also really discuss everything very democratic democratically. Um, I want to hear everybody's opinions and not just walk in and say, this is the way it's going to be because they have other experiences that I haven't had and they come to the table with great ideas and some things that I've never even tried before. And certainly on the marketing and social media and, uh, you know, all of the digital spend that we make, I'm the last person who ought to be <laughs> giving advice on how to spend it. So our whole team does that, um, which is fantastic. And we all in the end agree on the plan whether it's the plan for the year, the plan quarterly, we do a strategic plan at the beginning of the year, all the goals we want to set. And they're kind of lofty at the beginning of the year, but once we meet quarterly, um, we make them happen. And whether your team is seven people sitting in that room or three people, setting goals for yourself at the beginning of the year, even if they're high in the sky is really important. And then doing check-ins once a month or once a quarter um, to make sure everyone's sort of towing the line on their responsibilities of getting those things done. It's it's amazing what you can accomplish. Interesting. So you cannot control the chaotic nature of the environment that the fashion industry is in. You cannot you cannot control how much things cost, political situations, COVID. Um, but you can control the type of organization that you build, mm -hmm. how structured it is, uh, how planned it is, uh, what type of culture do you have, and what type of partners do you also work with? So use your energy and focus to try to control that as much as possible. And then have faith that if you do that properly, it'll know how to adapt to the chaotic nature of this industry. Right. COVID's a perfect example. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> everything, yeah. everything was crazy. Mm. Okay. But you know, we had great... there's so many. Yeah. No, wow. Yeah. No, I, I can imagine. Yeah. It's, you have the great team. You have the good mm -hmm. foundations. You have the good value proposition. Obviously, it doesn't make the experience any easier, but at least you survive, right? You go through the process. Yeah. You would have yeah. to react uh, without any big compromises or bad decisions on the long term. Right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. 
Wow, there's so many different things I want to talk about, Elise. Uh, but you know, let's let's use that as a teaser uh, because I do want to talk a lot more about. I think one of the most important things that ties all this together, which is exactly the team founders, mm -hmm. the dynamic between the founders, the relationship, the responsibilities, the people that you bring on. I think that deserves kind of like a conversation within itself, especially since you work with Kate. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I'm very interested in really understanding not only your dynamic, but also seeing this from a third person perspective, right? Mm -hmm. Um because you were you were probably looking at the business from a very objective point of view, which is something that you rarely find with brands like that. So let's use that as a teaser for our conversation and for the audience as well. Hopefully, we could talk more about that part in a later episode. Mm -hmm. uh, just for the sake of obviously not having you here for hours, because I can talk about this stuff forever. Okay. <laughs> but last question, just to conclude this part, is based on everything that we've discussed so far. What would you say to somebody else trying to build something similar? Would it be focus on one part of the industry, focus on getting or focus on getting the product right and finding the right people? Would it be focus on understanding which part of this industry you're good at and then trying to do that as better as you can and hopefully timing will eventually get on your side? Like, How can people be strategic and, 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 and learn... How can people learn from this episode and come up with like a specific strategy that they can apply that relates to them? What would be the foundational principles that you would tell them? You know, I would I would say to them, work at a company you really admire, who, who make products that you really like and learn how to do everything they do really well. Show up early, stay late, work closely with the founders because they obviously have a vision. And I think working with and alongside people who have started something um, is the best way to learn because that founders usually know how to, you know, they know how things are made. They know how to tape up a box at the end of the day and go down to FedEx and ship it. And they know every little intricate part of their business from A to Z. And I think working in a small company where you can gain a lot of responsibility and gain a lot of experience to decide if you even want to do that. And then once you decide, yes, I do want to do that, I think it's finding a product that is unique and different and better than other things out there. Even if it's the same in the same vein of the same world, it's got to be better than what, what's out there um, mm. in some way, shape or form. Uh, because there's so much out there that if you can't say why yours is so much better, um, then it's not really worthwhile. I think. Mm, okay. And when you say a better product, what makes a better product in all it? Because there's so many different things, right? What makes better products in your, what in, in your book, is it better price, better quality, better design, better marketing, better distribution? I wish I, <laughs> I, wish I had one of our bags here to show you. I could show you why. Um, just a, um, a product that people want and something that people, you need to tell them that they need it and why. And if it's got a if if it's a handbag that's got seven pockets in it, and there's a pocket for everything, and this is why you need this, and it also holds your laptop, and you could run over this bag with a truck, and it will still look as beautiful tomorrow, you know, as it as it as it did after you run over the truck. Um, th there's just there's so many things about each product that should be really special and different, and a reason for someone to want to buy it. Um, I I mean I'm I know the things that I own, why I like them so much and I could sell them to anybody, but I wouldn't just say it because they're, they're products that I like. I, I, I'm saying it because they're really beautiful, good products. And I think just making something isn't worthwhile. I think you want to, oh, look who's calling. <laughs> Andy Spade's calling. <laughs> um <laughs> Um, I won't take it now because I will literally be on for an hour with him. Um, but I, I think you have to have a real point of view and a really great product in order to even go into business. Because in order to even get financing from anybody, you have to be so excited about that product yourself mm. that other people are going to want to believe you and, and right. believe it. Yeah. And I think what's fascinating about good product is that you get to define what that means. 
if you if you resonate with products because of their features and mm -hmm. focus on features, if you resonate with products because of the quality and create the best quality possible, if you relate with products because of the price per value, do mm -hmm. that. If you relate right. with products just because of their crazy creativity and functionality or creative design or visuals or, or communications, then focus on that. But it's a matter of asking yourself, what do you value in the product? Going back to what we're saying at the very beginning, everything starts with what you want to create. And then the rest is all about speaking with the customers and helping with customers and, and using customers to help you evolve and build on what you already have. Yeah. Okay. Amazing, Elise. Thank you. Thank you for the time. Thank you for the information. And hopefully I can persuade you to come back on a part two some other time. Okay. That sounds great. It was lovely speaking with you and thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of the Beyond Fashion Business Podcast. I hope you found it valuable. If you're interested in joining our free fashion business course or our community of fashion entrepreneurs, make sure you click on the link in the description of this episode. I hope that they are also a valuable tool in your fashion journey.